So thanks to all of you for your continued attention on the final afternoon of the symposium. I'm Christy Murtis. I'm a PhD candidate with Walter Yes in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. And today I'm going to share some results from ongoing research that fuses movement data, observational data, and remote sensing data to evaluate scale dependence and species environment relationships for two species of Takas hornbills in East Africa. So first I'd like to reintroduce a couple of critical concepts that underlie this research to broadly generalize geological, chemical, and biological processes operating at different spatiotemporal intervals generally generate hierarchically structured landscapes that mobile species move around in these landscapes then have to respond to. And this is just a brief graphical demonstration of how that might work. Um, these processes are distributing critical environmental resources for species fitness unevenly across spatial scales. And species are then forced to respond at the subset of spatial scales at which these resources they depend on for positive fitness are available. There are a couple ways that could happen. Um, one is in a very passive manner uh, where species are responding roughly in proportion to abundance at, across all spatial scales and the shape of the response to different environmental variables is not changing across spatial scales. So this would be probably the most simplistic way we can imagine um, scale dependence in that um, the response is strictly proportional to abundance across all spatial grains. And we can imagine a different scenario uh, where the magnitude of the response or even the shape of the response of a species to a particular environmental variable might change with spatial grain. We have some extreme examples on the right here uh, where the response curves are shifting dramatically based on the spatial resolution at which you're measuring a particular environmental variable for a particular species of interest. And we have some expectations of which environmental variables are likely to be more important or more influential for species spatial distributions at different spatial grains. And these come strictly from the spatial structure of the environmental variables themselves. So we have a very coarse environmental variables such as temperature, precipitation, that vary slowly across spatial grains. Um, so an example of coarse spatial structure. And then we have variables that can change very rapidly at fine spatial grains like habitat structure, uh, vegetation composition, and we expect these variables to be most influential on species distributions at these grains at which they are varying in space, at which they're spatially structured. So I'm going to address these questions of scale dependence and species environment relationships using a series of multi-grain models of species distribution and a study system of two related hornbill species in Africa. And we're going to test these expectations from spatial structure and see whether scale dependence and species environment relationships adheres to or does not adhere, adhere to these expectations, and whether we can use this information to build more accurate and more informative models of species distributions and obtain inferences about ecological niche dynamics. So I'll briefly describe the study system, all field work. Uh, was conducted at Mpala Research Center in central Kenya. We just have a coarse land cover classification of this property here on the left, and a couple snapshots of what the landscape looks like in practice on the right. Uh, vegetation varies from very open, sparse red soils uh, to very complex, uh, vertically structured habitat. Not vertically structured in the same sense as a tropical rainforest, but two to four meter tall canopy, um, very short subcanopy and herbaceous layer. Um, most complex vegetation in these riparian areas here. And the two species I'll be talking about are congeneric, um, Vonderdecken's hornbill and red-billed hornbill. They have very similar diets, reproductive strategy. They both a seal completely, a female seal completely inside nest cavities during the breeding season. Um, they have similar diets, although the Vonderdecken's hornbill may be slightly more frugivorous. And the Vonderdecken's hornbill is also uh, slightly larger. These species both um, have residential home ranges of approximately the same size. So we're going to be combining environmental and presence and absence data. And I'll first describe the environmental data that we collected for this study landscape. Um, most of the habitat and land cover variables come from a very high resolution quick bird image of the study site. And we derived several um, 
variables from that. I'll just describe one of them briefly. If you want to go into detail later in the questions, we can discuss any of these. I'm just going to point out this vegetation complexity layer, which we derived from a composite index of vegetation structure derived from field measurements and then predicted across the study area using NDVI texture metrics. And I also just want to point out the one sort of climatic variable we have represented as a predictor variable here, uh, which is precipitation. And that's interpolated from local weather stations using topographical covariates. And then this is just an example of uh, how this vegetation complexity structural index um, varies across spatial grains in the study landscape. So I talked before about a multi-grain model framework. We selected six grains to include in this study, and I'll talk about in a little bit about why 10 meters is the finest grain we use. All other grains represent commonly used remote sensing data. So the Landsat platform, which is 30 meters, uh, MODIS platform, which is 250 to 500 meters, and then a common global environmental data sets such as, such as AVHR and Bioclim are often available at one kilometer. So we derived variables from a subset of native grains and resampled them to these very commonly used grains of analysis in ecological studies. Uh, so we collected two types of presence and absence data for this species. One, we attached miniaturized tags uh, constructed by the University of Constance Technical Workshop and the Max Blake Institute at Radzlfell. And we also collected observational data. So we performed timed surveys of randomly selected sampling areas across the study landscape and recorded our own uh, location using a handheld GPS unit and projected location of the observed individual encountered during a timed survey using compass, uh, compass and uh, laser rangefinder. And the spatial error associated with these method is what limits our ability, is what limits the finest grain of our analysis. So the spatial error associated with these types of measurements is usually a circular error region less than 10 meters. Um, so 10 meters is the finest grain at which we're analyzing uh, the, the distribution of the species. So I'll just go through an example of how we turn that observational data into presence and absence data for use in distribution models very quickly. And I'll use the von der Decken's hornbill for which we have a higher sample size as an example. Here you can see in yellow uh, recorded locations collected during focal sampling during timed surveys. And then these um, colored circles represent tagged individuals. And those uh, presence data are collected on the order of every 20 or 30 minutes depending on the tag model. These red areas are sampling regions that were visited approximately monthly since 2012. So we have a long record of surveys in each of these locations, which is where we're getting the reliable absences I'll talk about in a minute. And we're turning this very short-term movement path at the level of individual movement decisions. So we collect for an individual followed in the field into the nearest neighbor grid cell at each spatial resolution under study. In terms of absences, Again, we're using these defined sampling areas that have been repeatedly visited, and we're intersecting survey transects in sampling regions where we've never observed a species into a reliable estimate of absence. And then uh, when we put these all together over time, we're generating maps of presence and absence at each study grain, where each um, study cell is only counted once. Uh, so, there should, so we're trying to remove um, pseudo-replication in this analysis. So we combined the environmental data and the observational presence and absence data in a generalized um, linear mix model framework and found that the residuals of these models were highly affected by spatial autocorrelation, which you can see on the black smooth curve and points to the left, and then a representation of how uh, these resi autocorrelated residuals are distributed in space. We accounted for the spatial autocorrelation by adding um, a spherical autocorrelation structure to the random effect in the generalized linear mix model. And as you can see, that decreased the spatial autocorrelation and model residuals to an acceptable level. Uh, we then used information criterion and variable significance tests to select a final best model at each grain. And those are what I'm going to go through really quickly now um, at each study grain. So I'm just going to point out a couple details in the finest resolution predicted probability of occurrence for each species. The von der Decken's hornbill, Tacus decani, is always going to be on the left. And the red-billed hornbill, Tacus erythrorhynchus, will always be on the right. 
And we can already see some really different predicted distribution patterns for these two species at this very fine grain. Both species are predicted to avoid this area down here, which is actually a grassland area that does not contain the large trees required for these species' nesting behavior. So that's a good first indication of model accuracy. And then for the Von der Deckens hornbill in particular, we see areas of high topographic complexity around an elevational feature and then around uh, riverine features that form the boundary of the study site. Um, and these areas are often where very complex and very uh, structured vegetation is located. In contrast, the red-billed hornbill appears to be selecting bare areas that are often roads and trails, as well as these same riparian vegetation, or riparian areas with complex vegetation. So we see very different um, habitat selection patterns. And I'll flip through the results at each study grain, and you can tell me how much variation you see across spatial scales. So again, von der Decken's hornbill will always be on the left. Red-billed hornbill will always be on the right. And we're going through six study grains selected for congruence with commonly used remote sensing platforms. And you can see as we increase spatial grain, we lose the fine scale habitat uh, selection that we saw at the 10 meter grain, specifically for those um, topographically complex areas that are now predicted, predicted to be wholly suitable for the Bunderdecken's hornbill. And we're losing some of those fine bare areas that were predicted to be um, highly suitable for the red-billed hornbill. Okay, so then we can dig into these models a little bit deeper and look at how model coefficients, variable importance, deviance explained, and univariate model um, AUC changes across spatial grains to interpret scale dependence in a more quantitative manner. And just in brief, we see that our expectations from the spatial structure of the environmental predictor variables are largely met for the von der Decken's hornbill. Uh, the, structure, the vegetation structure variable I pointed out earlier is very important at fine spatial grains as expected. Also NDVI, which because we're drawing it from this very high resolution satellite imagery has very fine spatial structure is also important at fine spatial grains. And climatic variables like that creed precipitation layer are only important at coarse spatial grains. So the von der Decken's hornbill appears to be responding as expected to the spatial structure of the environmental variables themselves. Slightly different story with the red-billed hornbill. Uh, we saw that these bare areas were highly important at fine grains, and they remain important across all spatial grains, even though these variables, again, have very fine spatial structure. So this is a, a definite contrast and a sort of unexpected result. Similarly, the course precipitation variable that itself has coarse spatial structure is important at, in models at very fine spatial grains. So the red-billed hornbill is clearly responding to uh, environmental variables contrasting to their own spatial structure contrary to our expectations um, a priori. So what can we say in summary about scale dependence and species environment relationships from these results in a multi-grain modeling context? We can say that some species respond as expected. We can say that the shape of species environment relationships um, remains consistent. In no models did a linear term, let's say, shift to a linear plus a squared or cubic term or a log term. So the response remains similar across spatial grains. But the importance and the explanatory power of individual variables definitely changed across grains. And we saw that in those immediately previous plots. So some of you might be wondering, she mentioned tag data. Whatever happened with the tag data? That was used for validation of all of those models. Models at each grain achieved an AUC of higher than 0.85, so um, very successful, accurate at predicting species occurrence at each grain. But more interesting is using the tortuosity metrics obtained from these long-term movement pathways to attempt to disentangle whether the scale dependence that we're observing is due again to the spatial structure of the environmental variables themselves or due to some species traits. And we can test this by looking at um, comparing individuals that again, these species have residential home ranges. And we look at the spatial structure of the environmental variables within the home ranges and we see that individuals within a species are responding very differently um, in, their, in terms of tortuosity of movement paths we can say that scale dependence arises primarily from the structure of environmental variables. 
If, on the other hand, scale dependence is determined by species-specific factors, we should expect um, variation across species in similar environments to be, similar, to be different um, because it's arising primarily from species physiology and functional traits. So one brief set of preliminary results looking at these questions in tagged Vonderdecken's hornbills in, um, um, in environments that vary in overall vegetation cover from the top right to the bottom left, we see relatively similar um, fractal dimension or a metric of path tortuosity, which implies that even in home ranges that vary in environmental conditions, and even though the species adhered to our expectations of spatial structure, um, individuals within a species are, are, um, have congruent response, have congruent grains of response um, to these different environmental variables. So next steps are to, again, those preliminary results for only, were only for Vonderdeck and Hornbills. So the next step is to go out to the field and actually up our sample size for the red-billed Hornbills to test that the disentangling of um, scale dependence a little bit more thoroughly, and also to investigate Bayesian spatial models as opposed to generalized linear mix models uh, with an autocorrelation structure simply in the random effect, which is a little bit of a simplistic approach to this problem. And then also to test um, cross-scale correlation to see which spatial grains are providing the most unique um, explanatory power in, for the scale dependence question. And with that, I'd like to thank collaborators across the world and funding sources and take any questions. I think you have time for maybe one question that you can ask afterwards. So I'm just curious, what were the observed locations of the wonder? You showed us the model, but you didn't really show us where you observed the wonder. Sure, so I can go back to these sort of presence and absence maps um, at each grain. Yeah, let's just take the example of this map. So sure, so these are actually presence and absence maps, the green in presence and the red in absence at each spatial grain. Um, so we're observing these individuals pretty much as, as reflected in the models outside of this different land cover area. Uh, mostly along rivers and intermittent waterways, areas with complex vegetation and topography. I was just curious, you want to show some bias in terms of where you saw, and how was this sampling designed? So the sampling, these um, red areas are one kilometer um, sampling areas, randomly, okay, random. sure, randomly selected, but um, so stratified across an elevation gradient, and then randomly selected from within um, subcategories of the elevation gradient. 